Okay, if I just present a small summary of previous lecture. An electric field, uh, a battery creates an electric field in a conductor if the, when it is connected to our, our conductor. Now, this electric field will cause the electrons in the conductor to move, and it will create a current. Which we define the current as the current passing through an area per unit time. So that's basically the summary of the previous hour. Now, any questions? Well, let's come to one more concept before discussing it. Let's describe the current density. Okay, one thing about the current is that although we are showing a direction for the current, we are saying that, the, okay, the current is running in this direction, the current is a scalar quantity, current is a number. So it's not a vector. It doesn't have a direct. It doesn't uh, correspond to a direction. But we can define a concept quantity called the, with the direction, which we call the current density. We will usually use the symbol J. Now you see, if you have a large conductor, let's say a large one, it might happen that most of the current is flowing in this direction in this region, whereas a very little current is moving in the top region. That is possible to create such systems. For example, one way to do it is just, uh, just connect the battery in, at the bottom. You connect the battery here, just like this. So in such a case, most of the current will be running through this one, this region. Some of it will be running in the top region. Now, the current density is, you can just imagine it as the local current running through a given area. Okay? Before, some of you were asking, why don't we have this cosine or sine of theta? Because we are defining the current as the amount of charge passing through an area. Now, we define, let's say, if you imagine some area over here, we had already know how to define the area vector. This is the area vector. Through this small area, there will be some current running through it, and that small current we define as this current density times dA. Or you can think of the current density as the current running through a very small area divided by the area itself. But of course, you have to make sure that the area you choose is perpendicular to the direction in which the, your particles are running. So that is something you have to pay attention to. This is like the charge density. Now we will connect it to the charge density. Now let's just imagine we have a region, a very small one, where we have all the charges moving. Just for simplicity, let's just assume that our region is so small that all the charges in that region are moving in the same direction. They have the same velocity that let's say that they will be moving with the drift velocity. And we just imagine the area over here. This is our area that we will be using to define this current density. Now, if we wait, remember how we define the current. We, I mean, if we want to calculate the current density, we have to calculate what is the current running through this area. Uh, if you remember the definition of the current, this is just delta Q by delta T. You just wait an amount delta T, and then count how many charges passing through your area. If you take the ratio, then this ratio is just your current. 
Let's do it over here. Let's say we wait for an amount delta t. In this amount delta t, all of these charges will be moving a distance vt, vd times delta d t. So if you just imagine this volume, whose length is vd times delta t, all the charges in this volume will pass through my area. Agree? They are all moving in this direction. Well, this, the ones right at this point will barely pass through my area at the time delta t. These ones will easily pass my area in that time delta t. So if I want to count what is the total charge that passed through this area in this amount of time, it is just the total amount of charge in this volume. And it, the total charge in that volume is nothing but, let's say, the charge density times Vd times delta T times dA, where this NQ is the charge per unit volume. This much charge will pass through this area in this amount of time. Now we can calculate the current delta Q by delta T. This is equal to NQ with drift velocity times dA. This is the current passing through this area element. But from the definition of the current density, this should be current density times dA. So we find that the magnitude of current density is equal to NQ times Vd. Now we take one step further. The current density vector is equal to the current density times the drift velocity vector. Well, we basically, this, is the, this also fixes our convention for the sign of the current. You see, the current density for electro, the charge density for electrons is negative. Since it is negative, the, drift, the current density is in the opposite direction to the drift velocity of the electrons. That is why we choose the direction of the current to be in the opposite direction of that of the electron. Also keep in mind, in the old times when we discovered the currents, we didn't know about the electrons. So that is when the convention was fixed, at a period when we don't know about the electrons. We knew that there were some negative, some positive charges that exerted some forces on each other. We thought it was just some kind of a fluid running through the material. So as we don't like the negatives that much, Everything is towards the positive. Yes, any questions? <coughs> unit of the, well, let's see, NQ, charge per unit volume. The unit of NQ, what is the unit of charge? Coulomb. What is the unit of volume? Meter cube. Okay, what is the unit of current density? Well, it is the coulomb per, per meter cube times the unit of the speed, meters per second, so coulomb per meter squared second. Now, what is the unit of current? You see, remember the definition of the current. Unit of current is unit of charge, coulomb per second. So if you look at the current density, the unit of current density is coulomb per second per meter squared. It is the current running through a unit area. Now this coulomb per second, we give, give it a special name one coulomb per second, we call it one ampere. Mm -hmm. 
This is the name of the current. No, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that the electrons are not moving. On the contrary, they are moving, they are moving slowly. Secondly, I didn't say that the electrons are not the ones that are lighting the light bulb. What I said was the electrons that are passing through that light bulb over there are not the electrons that were here when I turned on the switch. The moment that I turn on the switch over here, the electric field builds up almost instantaneously. And that will cause the electrons right at the, even inside the bulb, to move through the bulb slowly. But even if they are slow, they will be what creates this, what they will be what causes the light bulb to emit light. Electrons. It's the electrons. Although they are moving slowly, they, will, they still call the, like the wire, if you have this uh, hot bulb, it will be the, it's the electron that causes that heat. Well, not in these fluorescent ones. So, is it possible that can you explain visually what's the situation of electrons and protons, either like dipole, other polar, whatever form, and then as the battery is on, what happens, what electrons move. Okay, let, let me demonstrate it. Okay, I just want some two or three people per stairs here. Stand up. I want just a couple of you, a couple of more. Some more, I mean, fill in the gaps. Okay, that's, that's enough. I mean, there are, there are all these gaps. Now, on my mark, I want you to walk down. On my mark. Now. Okay, you see. On my mark, all of you kept moving down. You didn't push each other. My mark is the electric field. You are the electrons. At the instant that I said, on my mark, all of the electrons started moving. So that's the electric field. Yes. Well, I know just a single one. No, we don't know that. You see, keep in mind, I mean, keep in mind your assumptions whenever you are making one comment. Before, we said that the electric field inside the conductor is zero in electrostatics. That comment is true only in electrostatics. Now we see that we... If we leave the domain of electrostatics, that command is no longer true. There is an electric field. It is the only electric field we know, which is the usual common electric field inside the metal. It can, we can have electric field inside the metal because we are no longer in electrostatics. Well, there is no, I mean, you see, you are the same person whether you are in this classroom or you go out on the campus or whether you go home. You are the same person, right? So I don't talk, call you a different person because you are playing football on the stadium. You are the same person. It's the same electric field. There's a single type of electric field. It just behaves differently in different circumstances. And when you go to sleep in your bed, you don't start playing football, right? It's a different circumstances. You behave differently. But it's the same thing. The same electric field. No, we didn't yet talk about the resistance. We didn't talk about the resistance yet. I will in a moment. But you see, this is something you have to keep in mind. This discussion. That in steady state, in or stationary state, when the, our system doesn't change in time, the current running through this point, the current running through this point, 
the current running through this point, they have to be the same. They cannot be different. And the main reason is in steady current or stationary in a stationary system, you cannot have a buildup of electrons anywhere. Except in capacitors. Okay, we do, we are not yet discussing circuits. Okay. We turn off the switch. Turn on the switch, sorry. Now, is there any change in distribution in any part? Is it steady state? Okay, we are not interested in that yet. We are only interested in steady states yet. There is no change. Nothing should be changing in time. As I said, except in capacitors. We will be discussing circuits with capacitors. Okay, ask me. Other questions? Now, let's come back to this current density. Now, we had this result that the current density is proportional to the drift velocity. Now, the question is, what is this drift velocity? How is it related with the electric field that we apply? Or how is it related with the potential difference across the capacitor, etc. Now, since we know that we have, now we, okay, are you convinced that we have an electric field inside our conductor in this new case, where we are not in, station, in statistic, statics, but we are in sta stationary systems or steady states? There should be a current. Now, and the, it's basically the current, the electric field that will create this drift velocity or this J over here, the current density. And it turns out that we can write, well, the current density will, of course, be a function of the electric field that we apply to our system. And usually this is written as E over rho. where rho is called the resistivity. So the larger the electric field you apply there will be at a given point, there will be a larger current density. Now that is kind of expected, right? So the, the larger the electric field, uh, the more <coughs> force you are exerting on the electrons, they will be accelerating more and they will be, on the average, they will be moving faster. If they are moving faster, there will be a larger current running through it. So let's look at this simple system where we connect it to a battery. The electric field inside will be more or less uniform. Of course, it might not be uniform if you are bending the battery but the, the deviations from a uniform electric field will be very small. And so at this point, there will be an electric field built. Well, at any point, there is an electric field built which is uniform. And the current density at that point will be 1 over rho times E. The total current will be just J times the area, if this is the area. I choose a, this perpendicular area, this one. 
So the current <laughs> in the current density times the area. Well, the current density we know that this is E times A over rho. This is the total current running through it. Well, the, since there is an electric field, there is a potential difference across my conductor. If we assume that its length is, let's say, L, the potential difference across, the resist, across this conductor will be just E over L, or the electric field will be delta V times L. No, sorry. E times L, and electric field is delta V over L. Now, if you just put it over here, the current running through the conductor will be equal to delta V times A over rho times L. And this whole thing is what we call the resistance of this conductor. Or in particular, we, know, we can say that the potential difference across our conductor will be equal to I times R. It's a constant that parameterizes the material, that depends on the properties of the material, just like its mass density. Mass density characterizes the mass of an object. And this resistivity, rho is called the resistivity, characterizes the, its electric properties. It depends on the type of material. Every material has a different resistivity. For conductors, the resistivity will be of the order of, let's say, 10 to the power minus 6 in suitable units. For insulators, it will be 10 to the power plus 6. Yes, any questions? Now, let's, let's, let's just check one thing. Let us suppose we have an object that has a small resistivity. Rho is small. Now, if rho is small, then the current density will be huge. Or if the current density is fixed, you cannot create a large electric field inside your conductor. For example, we will see that in superconductors, this resistivity is zero. It basically means that the electric field should be zero since we cannot have infinite current. So there is no current, there is no electric field in a superconductor because it has zero resistance. Since there is no uh, electric field inside the conductor, you cannot create a potential difference across a superconductor. <laughs> With the what? No, I didn't come up with the current density instead of in, in, he, this one. The current density is the this one. Current density and E. Well, let's just imagine this one. We said that if you just leave the electrons on their own, they're just moving randomly around, right? There's no current density. Why do we get the current density at all? We create an electric field. So the current density should be somehow related with the electric field. Current density should be related with the electric field. 
Well, what is this relation? Well, in general, we do not know. But we can always write any function of the electric field. Let's say this is, the, this is a function of the electric field as electric field divided by some other unknown function of the electric field. I can always do that. I can always, let's say, if this is just the electric field itself, the electric field is equal to electric field divided by the electric field. Whatever the dependence on the electric field is, I can always write it in this form. Now, if I write it in this form, I, all the derivations over here, they are the same. Up to here, but of course, R will be a function of the ele applied electric field, or else you can say that it will be a function of the applied potential difference in general. And then comes the Ohm's law. <coughs> Rho is independent of. of E. This is the basic statement of Ohm's law. The resistivity does not depend on the electric field. Well, is it true? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Some material, for some materials, for most of common materials, let's say, it holds within a suitable range of the electric field. You can calculate rho for very small electric fields and for a reasonable range of the electric field, rho will be independent of the electric field. So we say that that conductor satisfies the Ohm's law. If you apply a larger electric field, well, it will not satisfy the Ohm's law. Or we can create some other mixtures of materials which will not satisfy the Ohm's law even for very small electric fields. And if that is satisfied, then the potential difference across a resistor is just I times R, where R is just some constant. Now, what is the unit of R? It's, it's defined as one ohm, which is... Hmm? Voltage over ampere. This is the unit of the resistors, resistance. What about the resistivity? <coughs> well, the resistivity, we defined it over here. The unit of resistivity is the unit of the electric field divided by the unit of the current density. What is the unit of the electric field? It is newtons per coulomb. It is the force per unit charge. What is the unit of current density? The current is coulomb per second. Current density is the current per unit area. So this you can write as Newton's meter squared divided by Coulomb squared and second over there. This is the unit of rho. Or you can say that just looking at the definition of the resistance, resistance is rho times L over A. So from here, the unit of rho is ohm meter squared, no, ohm meters. Ohm meter squared over meters, this is ohm meter. Ohm meter is the same thing as this one. <coughs> yes? How do you write the potential difference as U E times L? Well, let's see. We define the potential difference as the integral of E dot DL. Inside the conductor, we are assuming that this, everything is uniform. So the electric field is constant inside the conductor. So this is equal to, here I have a minus sign, this is E 
minus E times delta L, which is minus E L. Well, in this equation, delta V is equal to I times R, everything we define as positive. So that's why I just ignore those minus signs. Yes, other questions? So, okay, hold on, hold on. So what you are saying is resistivity is a property of the material itself. So we take two different materials, <coughs> connect them, and apply, connect them to a battery. So this is material one with some resistivity, row one. This is some material two with resistivity row two. So how will be the electric field in each one of these? Now let's try to understand. Let's go back. To calculate the electric field, we can try to determine the potential difference. Because if we determine the potential difference, then by dividing it to the distance, we can calculate the electric field. Now let's try to calculate the potential difference across these two things. Let's see how, what happens when we connect resistors. First, let's start with series connection. So what happens? Now, rather than just drawing this all the time, such a shape, I will just show resistors with this symbol. This is a resistor. Its main job is to create some resistance. So this one over here is, in fact, I have a battery. I have one resistor with resistance R1, then another resistor with resistance R2, and they are connected to a battery, let's say, of voltage V. That creates such a voltage. This is R1, this is R2. And then when we turn on the battery, there will be some current running through the circuit. And we said that along a single wire, the current at every point will be the same. So the current running through this one, let's just call it I. It will be I over here. It will be I over here. It will be I over here. I is everywhere. Now this resistor, by the way, you can just imagine this resistor to be just a, bat, a light bulb. And this just gives off light or this can be a heater in your home, uh, so it will just give out heat. Now, the heat or the light is just, uh, it's just, you can imagine it as a conversion of the kinetic energy of the electrons to some other forms of energy, like the light energy or the heat energy. But the number of electrons is always conserved, and they are not accumulating anywhere. So the number of electrons that enter this resistor is the same as the number of electrons that enter this resistor and leave that resistor. The number of electrons do not change. Now we said that across a resistor, there will be a potential difference. Let's call this V1. Let's call this V2. And these wires, although every wire has a resistance, we will usually assume that the resistance of these wires are already included in this resistance R1 over here. So these wires over here, we will assume that they have zero resistance. Now, what is V1? Uh, uh, I times R1. What is V2? Well, we had already seen that the potential difference across the resistor is always I times the current running through the resistor 
times the resistance of the resistor. But V, the voltage of the battery is nothing but V1 plus V2. So this tells me that this is equal to I times R1 plus R2. And if one thing, if we define this as I times the equivalent resistance of these two resistors, one thing we see is that the equivalent resistance in the sense that if you replace, if you remove both of these resistors and replace it with a single resistor, and if we want to have the same current, we can just use a resistor of resistance, the sum of these two resistors. Okay, that is one thing. So we know what the equivalent resistance is. Now, furthermore, we know what the current is. The current is just V over the equivalent resistance. But now we know what V1 is. V1 is just I times R1 over R equivalent. V2 is equal to I times R2 over R equivalent. So we know the potential differences across both of these resistors. But if we know the potential differences, just divide these by the length of the resistor itself, you determine the electric fields inside the resistors. But then a the question, the number of electric field lines cannot change unless we have some charges somewhere. Isn't it V times R over? Yes, it's V times. So we know the potential difference, we can calculate the electric field. Now this is one type of connection. The other one, just like in the capacitors, we can talk about the parallel connection, parallel connection. Now, in this case, we have, let's say, the current running through this battery, this wire, need not be the same as the current running through the other one. They can be different. This is A, this is B, this is C, this is D. Now, what is the potential difference across the, the first, the second res R2? It's I times R. V A B. The potential difference across, no, sorry. This is R1. The potential difference across this resistor is just R1 times I1. <coughs> but V A B is equal to V C D because there is no potential difference between A and C, there is no resistance over there, and there is no potential difference between D and B, there is no resistance over there. And this just tells me that I1 times R1, this is equal to I2 times R2. By the way, these are all equal to V, the potential that we apply, because there is no potential difference between this point and this point, and this point and this point. So this tells me that I1 is equal to V over R1, I2 is equal to V over R2. Now let's, let's look at this point over here. I have this point A. There is a, let's call this current I over here. There is a current I entering that point. And there is a current I1 leaving that point and the current I2 leaving that point. Now what we are imagining is, again, go back to the stationary state. So the number of electrons that come to this point per unit time should be equal to the number of electrons that leave that point per unit time. Now I is coming into here, that, is the, that determines the number of electrons coming at the point A per unit time. I1 and I2 are leaving that point. And that those determine the number of charges, number of 
uh, charges that leave that point per unit time. So I should be equal to I1 plus I2. Well, this is nothing but conservation of electric charge. So the total I, which is I1, which we found as V over R1, and I2, which is V over R2, which we can write as V times 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, which we can use to define the equivalent resistance. Well, this equivalent resistance is, again, if you want to replace both of these resistors with a single resistor, such that the current running through the battery will be the same. So this is the resistance that you have to use. 1 over R equivalent should be equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Okay, so if you change the material, the number of electrons per unit volume, they will be different. Well, again, we are ignoring those transition periods. So we are always studying the steady state when we reach the stationary state, when nothing, is, nothing apparent is changing in time. Of course, there will be lots of complicated situations if if you combine two different types of materials, for example, a lead, light emitting diode, it is a system that has, uh, that's formed by connecting two different uh, conductors. So you have all kind, you can get all kinds of sophisticated properties. Those are things we are not studying here. I1 and I2. Yes. Okay, let us compare them. I1 over I2 is equal to R2 over R1. If you want to compare. It depends on the resistance. So, for example, if... Let's see. R1 is zero. If R1 is 0, then I2 should also be 0. So that is what we call the shorting a circuit. <coughs> you see, if R1 is 0, that is, instead of a resistance, you put a wire that has 0 resistance over here. That this, uh, this tells me that there won't be any current running through R2. All the current will be running through here, the short. So you are saying that if there is no wire over here, okay, so that won't be any put, uh, let's add a third potential over here. We have this battery, we have these two resistors in series. This is R1, this is R2, let's see, this is R3. This is I1, this is I2, this is I. And we just said that if R2 is equal to 0, this tells me that R1, now I1 will be, if R2 is 0 or R1 is infinite, very large, in both cases we know that I1 will be equal to 0 and I2 will be equal to I. Why? Well, I would say that if the resistance over here is zero, the electric fields, they just go through this one. 
the electric field lines rather than through the larger resistance. So you can, in general, you can say that the electric fields themselves, they prefer to go from smaller resistance. So if I2 is zero, R2 is zero, there won't be any electric field here in this wire. All the electric field lines will start from the battery. They go through this one and across R3. And there's nothing you can do to avoid this one. Since there is no electric field lines or electric field on this conductor, there won't be any current. How, how, does it how does the electric field decide? Let's see, how does the electric field decide? Hmm? Trial and error, not really. Well, let me cheat. Let me take 10 more, 10 minutes to answer your question. Okay, let's go for a break. After that, I will have the answer. Great.